our goal is, remember, that we want to see how this Ginzburg-Landau equation or the Ginzburg-Landau energy functional, which is a macroscopic functional, arises from some microscopic model, which really takes the individual uh, electrons into account in some scaling limit. And what I discussed last time was a spatially homogeneous variant of this model, right? So <coughs> let me write down the functional from last time. I want to say a few more words about this and then we move on to the, the real problem. But let me do that. Got my head of psi. Size. So this is the kinetic energy of the particles. Then we have a term, well, which involves the alpha alone. And then there's a coupling term in between, which is given by the entropy. And by this, I mean simply you form this capital gamma matrix, which has gamma as the left upper entry, ga alpha as the right upper entry, and then you continue it. And then you compute the entropy of this two by two matrix for every momentum psi. And then afterwards you integrate it over R. Okay, there was, I, I heard, mm, some comments after the lectures they should perhaps explain a little bit more where the physics of this comes from. I'm happy to do this, however I would like to do this a little bit later when we really go to the full model. Okay, so the thing that I want to say now only, I mean to repeat only, is this alpha thing, this represents superconductivity. If we have an alpha, non-zero alpha, then we are in, the, in a superconducting state, otherwise it's a normal state, okay? Now the gamma here is, um, represents the particles, the ordinary particles. Now it depends a little bit on what you're modeling here. If this is really a superconductivity, then the gamma models the electrons in the solid. If you have this in a superfluidity context, then rather it's the particles, they're really neutral atoms and in some, in some ultra cold gas and then the, the gamma stands for, for the atoms. So wh whatever, the, the gamma models some fermionic particles, ordinary particles. This would be without the alpha term, this would be the standard model that has been used forever in this context, okay? So the new thing here is to allow a second parameter, couple them to, the, um, to the, the gamma in such a way that if the, the alpha is zero, we get the old model back, but we have now the possibility of allowing us an additional alpha, which means that the system goes into this superconducting state. The, the interpretation of gamma hat is gamma hat, that's the momentum distribution. of these um, fermionic particles and in particular the, well, the total integral of this distribution, right, which I don't know, there's a two pi to the d over two and then it's gamma of zero, that's the, the total particle number. <coughs> Perhaps, yeah, well, I guess. And you might also say that, see that I did when I minimized, I did not fix the particle number. However, oh, bigger, I think, okay. However, I did not fix the particle number. However, instead I introduced this parameter mu and you see from this formula, this is really mu times the particle number, okay? So that is just a trivial mathematical step. I'm just taking a Legendre transform. So if I can compute this energy for every mu, then I take a Legendre transform with respect to mu and I get the energy at, at every fixed particle number. Okay? Conversely, if I know it for every fixed particle number, I do the Legendre transform in the other way and I get the energy at each, uh, for each uh, chemical potential. It's just a mathematical trick. I, I understand that physically it's perhaps more intuitive to think that the, the particle number or the density, I should say, because we're in a gas, uh, the density is somehow fixed. 
but mathematically it's much easier if you if you have uh, just add this to your Hamiltonian and and uh, do this minimization problem but physically it's the same thing okay now there was a question I heard no that no okay anyway so that was um, one physical comment and then one more thing I wanted to say mm. well, let me draw the picture again and I'm drawing here <coughs> whoops I forgot T that's of course the most important thing that's the temperature because we're interested in a phase transition when the temperature changes and so let me draw again this um, free energy as a function of the temperature it's a concave decreasing function and then there was a TC and for temperatures larger than the TC the energy is really that's the the, the free energy of the normal state right which is the one that we computed last time where alpha is equal to zero and over here we have a bifurcation and um, that's really the, the ground state energy. And then what I told you last time is we computed here at this point, we computed the, the left derivative, we saw that the derivative was continuous but the second uh, derivative is discontinuous and it was a quadratic behavior. And the thing that I interpreted as the baby model of Ginzburg-Landau is that the coefficient which is in front here, the E, can be obtained by minimizing something and the something is exactly of the form minus quadratic plus quartic. Okay? And which is exactly what we want to derive later in the spatially non-homogeneous case. Now, the one more remark which is perhaps interesting to some of you, the, the expression for E was particularly nice if this effective operator, so there was, um, which came as the, the, what is the Hessian, right? The Hessian in the, in the alpha direction of this functional, this when we took the second derivative with respect to alpha at the normal state, we arrived at this operator and the assumption that under which I could give you a nice formula for the E was that the kernel of this thing is non-degenerate. Right, so if we have this, then the expression was really just a minus lambda 2 psi squared plus lambda 3 psi 4. That was the, the E was equal to the inf of this, where psi is a complex number. Okay. Now the surprising thing I should say, which is just a, a side remark, is that this assumption is not generic. I mean, it's not ungeneric either, but there is a, right, the parameters in the game are the mu and the v. And now you ask yourself somehow in this parameter space, is it generic that this has dimension one or not? And actually it turns out there's an open interval where this degeneracy can be something else. And actually it grows. As the mu, I think, goes to zero, this degeneracy grows in, in open intervals and it becomes unbounded. Okay, so this is... Um, Perhaps surprising because for Schrodinger operators we know that the ground state is unique by some maximum principle for elliptic equations or some positivity of heat kernel or something but this operator has the, the large um, frequency behavior as the Schrodinger case but still the symbol is different and therefore these uniqueness results do not hold and, and therefore we have this, uh, this non-degeneracy, which one can study and which gives rise to different um, Ginzburg-Landau functionals, which you see here you have a U1 invariance, right? Which is a trivial way of, a uh, complicated way of saying that you can multiply psi by phase and nothing changes. But if you have these degeneracies, you can have uh, very big symmetry groups under which you're, you're invariant here. All right. So that was a bit of a review um, from last time. Now I want to do one computation here which I hope clarifies a little bit uh, what's going on and how, how to think about this. And 
this is, I want to compute the Euler equation for a minimizer. Okay, now I told you that we really, we don't care about solutions of the equation. We're really more interested in the ground states. But I think computing the Euler equation still gives us some, some way of seeing the problem and also motivates how we choose the trial state when we do a variational computation. Okay, and so the, the so Euler equation for, so it's not necessarily a minimizer, but let's say a stationary, well, okay, minimizer, minimizer, gamma alpha. And the, the good way to do this is that you, you take some, some convex combination, so gamma is the minimizer, and now you take a convex combination, which means that you have your t times some gamma tilde minus gamma, and then some alpha plus t times alpha tilde minus alpha. Right, and now we differentiate this thing twice at t equal to zero, and then this thing should be equal to zero. And now let me write this, so this term there, that's obvious, right? or d, so this is psi squared minus mu times this perturbation here, gamma tilde minus gamma hat. Right. And then we get for the entropy term, you have to, well, I mean, either you do it um, for the eigenvalues, I wrote on down the eigenvalues last time, or you use some general formula how to differentiate traces. Either way, you'll find tra a C2 trace the logarithm of gamma hat of psi over 1 minus gamma hat of psi multiplied by gamma tilde hat well of psi gamma hat right so that's this d psi and then of course this term that's the the term that's easy to differentiate that's plus twice the real part of integral v alpha bar alpha tilde minus alpha dx. And now the point what I want to do is I want to include this term here into that term. That sounds first a bit strange, but I want to get to this matrix. I want to, I want to say that the important thing is here this capital gamma matrix. So in other words, I want to apply here Plancherel's identity, okay? And then this thing is just the, the one, two entry of this matrix. So I can write this as there's a half appearing, Rd, there's a tr big trace of psi squared minus mu. And now there is a delta hat of psi, delta hat of psi bar. I apologize, delta has nothing to do with the Laplacian, but it's the standard notation in the physics books. So I prefer to keep it, and I hope it doesn't create any, any confusion. Okay, so plus this term. Okay, so this was, you see, this was just a, a, a well, just Plancherel's identity. I just wrote this here as the uh, entry. But now this is very convenient because, right, this has to be zero for every choice of gamma tilde. And so therefore I conclude that, the, that psi squared minus mu, whoops, and I didn't tell you what, with delta is equal to V times alpha. Delta of x is equal to v of x alpha of x. Right, that's this guy here. Now this is, uh, as usual, right, when you do an Euler-Lagrange equation, this has to be zero for every choice of this thing. So therefore, this trace has to be equal to zero. So we get an operator identity that psi squared minus mu delta hat of psi delta hat of psi bar 
minus psi squared plus mu, this thing plus t over 2, the logarithm <coughs> of gamma hat of psi, 1 minus gamma hat of psi is equal to 0 for almost every psi. Okay, and now I can solve this equation. The, this is a, a two by two matrix. We know these matrices commute, so it makes sense, right, if I divide these matrices and take logarithms of those, right? So now I solve this equation for gamma hat, and what I find is after little computation, one plus e to the one over t times this matrix. Okay, so the optimizer, th this is a convenient form of writing the, the gamma and the alpha of the optimizer. It's again given by a Fermi Dirac distribution, just like for our normal state, except that something has appeared on the off diagonal. Okay, and so this, what appeared on the off diagonal obviously creates some off diagonal for the gamma. So this thing, this is often called the, the effective uh, BCS Hamiltonian, okay? It's, and it's this operator that, that we have to study and later on in the, in the real full model uh, for which we have to do semi-classics and, and do all the, the thing. Um, but that's really the equation and you see the non-linearity. You see appears, I mean, this is a self-consistent equation because we know that delta gamma is equal to V alpha, right? And alpha is this entry. That's, that's the Euler equation in the translation variant model. Okay, and now this gives us a hint how we should construct a trial state, right? If we talk about the upper bound, we wanna say here, look at this picture, we wanna say that the energy is smaller by a quadratic amount, quadratic in Tc minus T by a quadratic amount, smaller than the, the free energy of the, the free energy of the normal state. So, well, what's a natural guess? Well, we just take this, uh, a state gamma, so construct trial state, of the form, gamma hat of psi, right? This, whenever you do this, this automatically is between zero and one. So it's admissible in the sense that we have, you have to work a little bit that this, if this guy is nice, then the, the, the one, two entry actually is in, in H1. So there's some regularity that you have to do, but that's not too difficult. And anyway, so that's our trial state, one over T psi squared minus mu, and now I put here h to the a hat of psi, and here uh, the same thing, h to v a hat of psi bar minus psi squared plus mu. Okay, right, I told you that we have to guess something. And th that's a very good guess. The parameter that we still haven't decided is this A now. But we know somehow that in the optimal case, the A will be given somehow in this nonlinear way by the alpha. But now let's forget that constraint. Just take any old A, plug this in, compute the energy for this. Right? And I put an H here. I didn't really tell you why this really is of order H, but you can take an, uh, another small parameter and then see that this actually wants to be of the size H. Plug it into the equation and then compute. Okay? And what you find is, so if you take this for an arbitrary A, then compute to find, compute to find, it's a little bit wrong what I'm writing, but well, I know how, how wrong I, uh, let me see. Yeah, okay. 
alpha is equal. Okay, so there is this, of course, because h is small. Zero. But then I have phi kt plus v tc, if you want, phi a, which has an h squared in front, plus o, uh, let's say little o, h squared. Okay, and this, to first approximation, think of this just as A. Okay, it's an order one thing. But you see, somehow, there's an H squared term. Remember, H is square root Tc minus T over Tc. So this thing is linear in Tc minus T. We want to prove something quadratic, so we want to kill that term. Okay, so therefore we want to have the phi a be an eigenvalue of this ktc plus v. And then because phi a is closely related to a, this translates so into having a an eigenvector of this. Want this equal to zero. Um, so, right, because we want to make this as small as possible. So I want this equal to zero, which gives a in this kernel. So can, can, can you explain the a? How the a appeared here? I'm saying the or, no. The, I mean, right? It for, was to just like in the gas. Like yes, the exactly. Gas. Right. So I mean, right? I have to come up with a gas for the uh, gamma and the alpha which is a complicated thing to do. So I motivated my guess by saying, well, the true thing is of that form, where, where the alpha here is coupled to the, the, this off-diagonal uh, delta. Now, I just ignore that nonlinear coupling. Okay, so I just take alpha whatever, plug it in. So it has a good form, I think, right? Whatever a, then I compute, and I see that the best thing I can do, so I mean, think really there's an a here. It's really everything else it make, just makes it look more complicated. I want to make this com s as small as possible, so therefore I choose A to be in that kernel. So, so, so if I understand well here what you are saying, that if you have a minimizer with alpha close to zero, most likely it should look like that. That's exactly, it. right, exactly, right. That's somehow that's what's done in the lower bound, right? In the upper bound, I guess something, I try to make it that, but then in the lower bound, I have to say that really everybody, as you say, really every, al for, the, for every minimizer, the alpha really looks like that, exactly. Okay, thank you. And then, so now we have found out, so this thing, the vanishing of the h squared term has told us what the a should be, Okay, and now we just compute further and compute the h to the 4 term. Now use um, the, well, okay, now compute, well, okay, now compute h4 term. And you use that it's in this kernel to, to cancel a few, a few terms. Okay, so that's that. Now, of course, as you said, the difficult thing would now be to, to show that every, um, every minimizer is approximately of this form. This you get somehow from a H1 gap inequality, which I perhaps I explain a little bit in the last lecture, but that I want to um, skip at this point. What I rather want to tell you, perhaps it's, I, I'm, so this was really the proof of the theorem, but I want to tell you something else again related to this, perhaps this for some is more attractive or more intuitive, okay? I show you a different way of get arriving at the same result. And it's a way that is perhaps even more important if you do a time-dependent analysis where you really work with an equation more than with, a, with an energy, okay? So the, and this, well, So the point is, right, I mean, this is a two by two matrix. And we know how to take the exponential of a two by two matrix. I mean, we have to, to compute, but it's nothing impossible. And we also know how to take inverses of two by two matrices. 
So if we really sit down and do this computation, then what we find, just for the for the one two entry, is that <coughs> um, well, I, I guess I should put it up here. This is that the one two entry that's alpha head of psi on this side is equal to. Now let me do the find this thing here. So that's minus delta hat of xi over 2 times tang xi squared minus mu squared plus delta hat of xi divided by 2t, everything divided by xi squared minus mu squared plus delta hat of xi squared. Okay, so that's the Euler equation. I mean, or at least part of the Euler equation rewritten. Okay, now, except for a moment that the, the delta is small, right? That's what we want to show. We want to show that somehow if the temperature is close to the critical, then the, 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 the superconductivity disappears. So alpha is small, so delta is also small. So to leading order, we can ignore here the, the, the delta term. And what do we get? We get exactly this tang of xi squared minus mu divided by xi squared minus mu, which is exactly our old kt operator, one over it. Okay, so to leading order, this equation to leading order on the left side there's nothing to say about leading order, but on the right side I have minus delta, let me write this V alpha hat of psi. There's the twos that cancel each other, and then there is a well tang. 2tc <coughs> divided by xi squared minus mu, uh, and that's it, right? But now, if you look at this equation, that's exactly alpha is equal, so uh, minus, so what do I have? I have v alpha, I have 1 over ktc, yes? This, the, the kt was in Fourier space to multiply by one over this. So once again, in this way, I arrived that from this solution, I, I arrived at this conclusion that A is in this kernel. A denotes the, the leading order of alpha. But now let's go on, if this works, okay? Let's expand this to next order. Well, to next order, there are two contributions. The first contribution comes, now I cannot neglect the delta hat squared in there, okay? So that gives me something, so go on. So I have zero on the left side, and there I have, I don't know, well, perhaps I should not write everything here, but there is something, there is certainly a, del a delta hat from here, and then I get a, a delta hat squared, right, times something which is some function of xi. Plus, but what is the other change that I must not forget? That here I have temperature T, whereas I'm interested in temperature Tc. So there's a change in temperature. So therefore it's plus, so I differentiate this thing with respect to T, and therefore I get a Tc minus T divided by Tc, and this is multiplied by a single delta hat. And there again, there is some function of, of xi. So here, this you see, this is this cubic Schrödinger equation that, that you want to get. Of course, we're in the spatially homogeneous case, so there's no gradient yet. But you see that this is, so the delta is proportional to alpha. Um, alpha has this coefficient psi, and the, this is exactly the psi um, that, that, that solves this equation. You also see from this equation afterwards justified the delta hat squared has that order of magnitude which is h squared, so therefore delta hat is equal to h or order of magnitude. In case you were wondering why did I put an h here, why was this the right choice? Okay, 
So that's on the equation level and if you want to do something time dependent how you should think of this and how the, the, the non-linearity arises. So the, let me say the non-linearity, the power psi to the power 3 comes from here from doing the expansion. This is um, expanding this Fermi Dirac distribution. And then the linear term in the equation, the, the psi term, comes from the temperature difference and has the, the smallness of the temperature in front. Good. So that was mm, what I wanted to say about this. Mm, let me see. Are there any questions so far? Because now I think I want to move on and I want to really talk about the, the real problem. Okay? Good. So again, there will be lots of definitions at the beginning, and I hope that, but I hope that the things are now more familiar to you after having seen it in this special case. So this, this derivation of ginzburg landau theory from BCS theory. And I will follow here uh, two papers uh, together with Heinzel, um, Seiringer, and Soloway. The first one appeared in uh, Journal of the American Mass Society in 2012, and the second one in Communications in Math Physics this year. Okay, and you, I hope you can find the details in there. Okay, good. So, essentially the setup is similar. We have a functional, a free energy functional, that we want to minimize. This functional sometimes will have an alpha, which is uh, zero, and sometimes it's uh, non-zero. And we want to compute now a T, for which this transition happens between superconductivity and normal state. And then we want to say, just like we did in this picture, we want to zoom in at this point where T is close to Tc, and there we want to get an effective equation for how this alpha looks like. Okay? So we've seen here that the upshot of this discussion was to leading order the, the alpha looks like uh, a solution uh, of this equation. And now, but now this was the in Fourier space, and now we also want to take spatial variations into account. And that's what this paper does. So I have to, so let's talk about the, the admissible states. What's more complicated here now is that the, the states over which we are optimizing are oper operators. Gamma, capital gamma, and these are operators on L2 RD plus L2 RD. Okay, so you can think of it as a two by two matrix where there are four operators. Such that, well, what do we want? Well, they should be self-adjoint, and not only that, they should lie between 0 and 1, in the sense of operators, right? If you test against some element, some normalized element, then you should get a number which lies between 0 and 1. Now, the next assumption is that, um, which looks a little bit complicated, so this is u, gamma u star is equal to 1 minus gamma bar. Okay, now I have to explain you what these things are. Where u 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So that somehow flips the matrix around a bit and gamma bar is equal gamma surrounded on the left and on the right by complex conjugation. Now, I know this is a little bit strange in this theory, but 
we need complex conjugation. The reason, if you want to really understand the, the basics from this, is <coughs> usually we identify a Hilbert space with its dual, right? That's this Ries theorem. However, what sometimes gets lost is that this is actually anti-unitary, right? So what really happens is this operator does not in L act in L2 plus L2, but really it acts in L2 plus the dual of L2. Okay, and so this dual of L2, that gives you somehow complex conjugation. Now, I just, it's just confusing if we think of these elements as uh, conjuga uh, complex conjugates of L2 elements. So therefore, I move over the conjugation to the operators. Just ignore that point. This is really not important. It's a formalism that Bogolyubov came up with this. It nice, it's nice, it works perfectly, but there, there is no, no complicated mathematical content in it. So let's, let's just ignore the, this. <clears throat> if you really want to read more, there's this review of Heinz Land Saringer and some older paper of Soloway. And for practical purposes, what this means is that we have a gamma up there. There's an alpha and there is a alpha, let me, okay, let me say a bar and there's a gamma bar, okay? where alpha bar is equal to alpha star <coughs> and yeah, that's what we get. So there are a couple more assumptions. The next assumption is again related to something we cannot do but would like to do. <coughs> so we assume gamma is CD periodic. which means that if tau k denotes translation, then oops, gamma com commutes with these translations. What this really means in practice is that we cannot deal with the boundary. That's unfortunate because the boundary is really important in Ginzburg-Landau theory and there are some effects, especially on the on, at the onset of superconductivity, where boundary conditions matter. And it is somehow understood by the physicists that <coughs> what boundary conditions you should get. And particularly interesting is if the electrons here satisfy Dirichlet boundary conditions, then the Ginzburg-Landau theory should have Neumann boundary conditions. Okay, so that's rather, you can already, I mean, from this, you can already see that there's some complicated mathematics going on that we do not know at the moment. So we ignore this issue by just saying, well, let's just talk about periodic operators. Everything takes place on a torus if you want, and, and there is no boundary. And that's, I mean, that tells us what the bulk, how bulk superconductivity looks like. So, well. And then the other thing, is just a, a technical condition and or technical, I mean, just because we do this variational problems, you want to have a well-defined energy. So we want to have that this thing has finite kinetic energy. It's an H1 condition. The thing that you should ask me at this point, well, this is a periodic operator, this is a periodic operator. How can a periodic operator be trace class? Well, it can't. So this thing here really is the trace per unit volume. It's just like, I mean, you cannot compute an L2 norm of a periodic function. So what you do is you just compute it over a period. There's some, some things going on here, especially when you want to prove bounds, but let's, let's ignore that for the moment, okay? <coughs> so this is the setup. These are the operators. Now, I keep saying that um, uh, last time we talked about the, the spatially homogeneous case. What does this now mean? <coughs> so that's this important example. So let, and I give them tildes, be as last time. So I also defined admissible states last time, yesterday. Okay? And so these are functions now in, on R3. There are some because of the, these funny um, conditions. 
conjugation conditions, I want to assume that they are reflection symmetric. Then the important thing is, and I define this operator capital gamma in terms of a kernel, and it's just a convolution operator. Right, of x minus y, and I insert another parameter h in there, whose importance will be clear later, alpha tilde x minus y over h, alpha tilde, say, y minus x over h bar, and then here I want to have a 1, so this is kernel delta. I guess I have to take this out. Don't worry too much about these formulas. Um, minus gamma tilde x minus y over h bar. Okay. I just define it as a con the old operator as a convolution kernel. Okay, which I can in addition scale. Then this is admissible in this sense. in this sense, in the new sense. OK. Good. So now we need a functional. So we have the same microscopic data as before, the same assumption on the micro data as before, microscopic data. There was the chemical potential mu, the temperature T, and the interaction potential V, and there were some LP conditions. And now there are some new things, some macroscopic data. Okay, and now these are A, that's a magnetic vector potential. It's assumed to be periodic. And there's an electric potential, again periodic, and we need slight, regular, uh, slight regularity conditions, namely that the Fourier coefficients are summable. Okay, so that's um, the function will be in particular continuous. And there's a a k hat. And there has to be even some, some control on the derivatives, so there will be c1. It's, I think I want to say that these are ro still rather weak assumptions. And I, I'll explain that in a, in a minute. But I want to distinguish these two. This is what we've seen. This is what the electrons see. This is what you do in your lab, right? You have your lab. Here's your superconducting sample. And now you turn on a magnetic field, which really lives on your mm, laboratory scale or an electric potential. So they, they, these two things live on different scales. And then the energy functional becomes the following. So there's a, I put in front, I put an h to the d fact in front just to get rid of uh, lots of h to the minus d's afterwards. There's a trace minus i h nabla plus h a squared plus h squared w minus mu gamma. Okay, that's... Similarly as before, that's a term that involves gamma alone. Then there's a coupling term, which is just a trace of gamma log gamma. And then finally, there's a term which involves the alpha alone. It's an integral over Rd times T3, Td. 
and it's scaled x minus y over h alpha of x comma y squared dx dy. Okay, and now before we look at this in more detail, let me perhaps say that this thing reduces to the old thing if you do this thing for the states and if you don't have any external fields. That's a computation which somehow tells you more or less what this trace per unit volume is. So compare if, so if gamma arises from gamma tilde alpha tilde as above, And if A and W are identically zero, then FT of gamma is equal to, there's an unimportant factor of 2 pi to the D in front. And now this is FT, I should emphasize this is the old functional of gamma tilde alpha tilde. Yes, that's a computation. And, and I should say that, I mean, this is the old functional, but let me stress that it's independent of h. So it's really just psi squared minus mu. There is no h in front, and there is just a v and not a v um, of x divided by h. And now, of course, I have to tell you why. <laughs> but let me, yeah. I have a question. Like alpha is a function of what? Alpha, alpha is the integral, sorry, I should say it's the integral kernel. Because here you are putting x and y, one is in part d and one is in the core. So. Yes, that is, um, okay, alpha is a periodic operator on rd. Where, where did I write it here? Yeah. Okay. So therefore, if you think, how does an, a, a periodic operator on Rd um, look like? Well, you can, I mean, it, what happens here, if I shift the, the it, it means, it means that alpha of x plus k, y plus k is equal to alpha of x comma k. If you move both at the same time. So therefore, if I would integrate here over the rest, I would, it would become infinity. But this piece I have to integrate. Mm -hmm. So integrate y in the torus and x in the host. Yes. I mean, what this really stands for is, I mean, it, there is a limit taken. But since it's a periodic function, you restrict yourself to some kind of a fundamental cell where, where this thing is, is non-trivial. I mean, just, I, I really think it's a good Perhaps I should even do it. I mean, if we do it in this case, right, if we plug in a convolution operator, if there's an x minus y, see, what's the good thing about this? We can change variables. Instead of integrating dx dy, we can integrate dx plus y, perhaps over 2, and dx minus y. So if we do the dx minus y integral, we get exactly what we had before. And the dx plus y over 2, that just lives between 0 and 1. OK? I think that's perhaps the, the better way of thinking about this. OK? And right, you, you're right. I mean, what I'm always doing here is if I have trace class operators, I just write the operator of x comma y to denote its integral kernel. OK? So this of x comma y, that's the integral kernel of yeah, the operator. These are taken in which sense? Here you are taking traces. These traces are in this unit volume sense. So in particular, I mean this, what you might, this is here again, this in the, perhaps this is not so trivial, this what I said there. If you have the trace of, of a convolution operator, okay, then this means that you integrate the Fourier transform. Okay? That's somehow, that you see somehow if you do, right, if there is no W, is no A. So this is, everything is, is diagonal in Fourier space. And so this trace is just the integral that we had here on the, on the board up there. Okay. 
Any other questions? I know it's, it's a lot of stuff, a lot of material. Someone, it's, it's not so easy to digest at the beginning. I what I want to stress is somehow here, see the, the things that break the translation variance are the A and the W. And they are small. They have H's and H squares in front. So therefore, to leading order, we are still in this old regime. And therefore, we need to first understand the translation variant case, which we hopefully have done, at least to some extent. And then we see now how do these spatial variations that are introduced change the results that we have. So there are two parameters now. One parameter is this H, and the other parameter is the, the how far we are away from the critical temperature. And eventually, we will couple them and look at the joint limit. And that's how we will get ginzburg landau theory. Let me explain you how the H's, why the H's arise there, okay? So there are two points of views that you can take. You can either view it from the point of view of a particle, those ordinary particles that you want to model, or from the point of view of the lab. So this is from the point of view of the particle. That's what the particle sees. Well, the particle has a kinetic energy minor, which is given by minus a uh, Laplacian. Okay? And there's an interaction potential. How does it interact with its neighbors? V of x. Right? So here's the particle. And somehow the, this V has some LP conditions, so it, it goes to 0 at infinity. So I, I just see some finite range, which has size 1. Okay, but now I have my lab, and if the particle has size one, then the lab has a huge size. And so I call the size of the lab h to the minus one. Which I just give it a letter, right? h is for me a small letter, so I call one over h is a large letter. Okay, so that, that's a big thing. And on this big scale, that's where the lab is, there I apply my external magnetic field A and my, my W. Okay? So these are, so the external fields, I still have to tell you how strong they are. So let me denote the strength of the fields by G. Let's now, let's just call, uh, talk about the scales where they live. So this is H of x, right? It varies only on the lab scale. And the other thing that we have is the, the a magnetic field, that's the curl of A, that also varies on the lab um, scale. Now, what you also can do, and what's perhaps a little bit more natural when you really want to think from your lab perspective, Well, this is your lab. Your lab has size one, right? And now there's something tiny, tiny little uh, thing going on with the electrons. Now you say the scale where the electrons live, that has size h, which is the same thing. I'm just denoting scales differently. But I have to be careful what the, what the, how these quantities scale. So the kinetic energy now has become Right? I'm rescaling space, so the kinetic energy has become minus h squared Laplacian. And the interaction has become v of x over h. This is exactly what we see over here, right? If you, if you ignore the external a, then there's a h squared in front of the Laplacian, and there's a 1 over h inside the interaction potential. Now, the ex how about the external fields? Well, they are just g w of x and g b of x. Now, one thing that we should remember is, right, 
what I want to address now is both here have a G in front, the same strength, whereas over here it seems like the A has an H and the W has an H squared. That comes from the fact that what is the magnetic field? It's the, the derivative of the, I mean the curl of the, the vector potential. But now this curl here is computed on these big um, scales, so therefore I lose an H so this g over h um, curl of a of x. Okay, if I compute the curl here in my macroscopic coordinates. So I hope this motivates <laughs> at least, I mean, I haven't told you why g is equal to h squared, why I choose these particular strengths, but at least I hope it, it, I told you where this h suddenly comes from. It's not the Planck constant. It's if you want, it's an effective Planck constant, but it's really this ratio between the lab size and the, the, the uh, atom or the electronic size. Okay? And eventually this H will be a small parameter. Okay? I also explained where this comes from. So now I should tell you a little bit how the, why I want to have it H squared. This, by the way, is stuff that, that is not in the physics literature. I mean, it's even very far from being there. This is all that, that it took us years to, to figure this out, that these are the correct scales. Now, I mean, it looks obvious, but just, just saying. Okay, so what we've seen here, the energy change, so change in free energy, that was Tc minus T, okay, squared, right? That's here from this picture. That's how if we are a little bit below uh, the critical temperature, by how much the, the energy changes. Now on the other hand, we have the added these external fields, okay? They, over there where we said they, they have strength G. Now the external fields, they couple to alpha. They, I mean, they also couple to gamma, of course, that's how it looks like here. But the, the, the fact that they couple to gamma, that's subtracted because I only compute relative to the normal state. So really how they affect the system is how they couple to alpha. And so therefore what I get is, so the uh, external fields, Um, there, so I called the influence G. Oh, let, let me, okay, yeah. well, let me write it immediately as, as H. But then they couple to alpha, and really they couple to alpha squared because that's the if you look at this, a gamma is like alpha squared. So they have a TC minus T over TC. Okay, that's their strength. That's the size with, with which they're multiplied. Now, in order to get something non-trivial, so non-trivial regime, is when Tc minus T over Tc is equal to H squared. If you did not follow that derivation or did not believe me, that's okay. I mean, you can just take this as a definition. I'm just trying to motivate why we're balancing two effects. And that's, um, there is a certain regime, the temperature has to be close and the, the, the strength of the external fields. And now, well, I still have time, so let me continue. Here, let's look at this, let's study this thing a little bit. <clears throat> and let's do the same thing as what we did last time, right? The first step that we have to do is we have to know our enemy. We have to find what is the normal state, right? That, that's what we have to, to compute. So we take alpha equal to zero. Here, this becomes a diagonal matrix, you see? And so then we can compute um, and minimize explicitly. And it's more or less the same lemma as what we had last time. So 
so it's the normal state. What we have to compute is the minimum now just over gamma of the trace minus i h nabla plus h a squared plus h squared w minus mu gamma plus t times uh, the trace um, trace of the log gamma log gamma plus 1 minus gamma log 1 minus gamma. Okay, I can, since I can move the complex conjugation out of the, the trace because it's uh, anti-unitary. Okay, and so the analog of this lemma that you believed me yesterday, and so I hope you believe me today again, is that H be a lower semi-bounded operator and let's fix some temperature T. What we want to do is, last time, yesterday, remember we minimized over numbers rho, now we minimize over operators. Okay, same thing, so we're computing a Legendre transform and what we have to prove is that, in fact, the rho actually commutes with the h, and therefore the whole problem becomes commutative, and you get the same um, answer as yesterday, except that you have to put the, the trace, I mean, sum over the individual eigenvalues. If you understand the proof for, for matrices, then you also understand it for operators. There's no problem with infinite dimensions or stuff. So, and... The inf is attained if and only if rho is this Fermi Dirac distribution, which is 1 plus e to the minus uh, plus h over t inverse. Okay? So one has to, to do something, but once one has this, one concludes, so here, for us, in this minimization problem, gamma is this thing with this one-body operator, and therefore the capital gamma, we know if we know what the little gamma is, we also know what the capital gamma is, and I call it gamma zero. So that is one plus e to the h over t inverse 1 plus e to the minus h bar over t inverse, there are zeros. I'll tell you in a second what h bar is, and this is the same as 1 plus e to the minus, I'm saying plus 1 over t h minus h bar. inverse where h script so script h is this minus i h nabla plus h a squared plus h squared w minus mu okay it's i'm just applying this here this this h is the script h and i'm so i computed this entry and then because of this formula, I know that if I have this entry, then I get the entry down there by taking one minus the complex conjugate. And therefore, I, I, from this, I get that entry. And then I do a little computation and see that it's actually, um, that I can also write it like this. Okay. And perhaps you already smell what will be coming. Namely, when we have the external fields, there will be some off-diagonal entries. Okay, and the off-diagonal entries will be small, but they will no longer, just, I mean, this is no longer a translation variant operator, so therefore these off-diagonal entries will no longer be translation invariant, right? So, but the, 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 the translation variance is broken only by a very small amount, so some are up to commutators, we are this, and if we compute the commutators to high enough order, then we will get the gradient psi in Ginzburg-Landau theory. 
Let me make, what's that question? Script. Script H bar. This is script H, sorry. Oh, this is complex conjugation, just in this sense, in this sense that oh, if I, right, nice. exactly. So what this means is the magnetic field changes sign. Okay, okay. okay, right. So there is, in this Hamiltonian, we c let me put here plus and, uh, uh, no, sorry. Let me put the I <laughs> over here and then I have to make a plus here. I think that's right. Then you see this is a real operator, this doesn't do anything, but this, when you apply it to a complex conjugated wave function, then it changes sign. And similar, since W is real, nothing happens there. Okay? So this is this because we're really working in the, the dual of L2 and not in, in L2 <coughs> itself. Okay? What I want to notice, however, is that this operator is not bounded from below this whole operator, right? I mean, this operator is bounded from below, but in the lower entry of an operator which is bounded above but not below. It's a little bit like a Dirac operator. But it's one has to be, later on when we do semi-classics, one has to be rather careful about the structure and what, what one does there. And one more thing is, so if I, I can also compute the free energy now of the normal state. Right, here it is, minus T trace of the logarithm of 1 plus e to the minus this operator. Mm -hmm. And you see somehow to leading order, when I ignore these things, um, then it's equal to zero. And I put, remember, I put the h to the d there. So this is equal to, that's sometimes called Weil law, which roughly says that you can uh, replace the, the trace by the integral over, uh, over phase space. And so you have a logarithm, 1 plus e to the minus xi squared minus mu <coughs> um, over t d xi over 2 pi to the d, okay, plus <coughs> little o of 1. That's called vile asymptotics. We'll talk more about those files. Law. Now, what people can do is they can expand this further. Okay? In particular, there is, since the, the sub-principal symbol here has some, um, some cancellation property, there is no term of order h. And then this term really would be of order h squared if the A and the W were nice enough so that I could do semi-classics. However, these assumptions are weaker than that. So the way I will prove my theorem is not by computing the energy, the minimizer to some large precision and then computing the energy of the normal state to very large precision and then subtract it from each other, but I rather will compute the difference of both. Okay, this allows me to, to work under these more modest regularity conditions. And it's also um, very important somehow when you deal with, I mean, we really, as I said, we go to fifth order and you really have to, to try to minimize your, your, the amount you have to work. So let me draw a picture to finish this lecture. This thing, that's exactly the energy that we had last time. It's exactly the same thing. We also see, see it from this formula on the third line up there. Okay, we turned on our A and the W. What happened was that this thing somehow got smeared out. I mean, not smeared out. It's th there's a definite change of order H. <coughs> um, so this thing here, this width here, this is order H squared. This is this amount by which the, the free energy changes um, as H changes. And this was our old critical temperature. And uh, the preview of what I will prove is that this thing here will also change to order H squared. Okay, and somewhere, so there's a region where we, a small region where we don't really know what to do. And then 
this thing, um, the, the energy will bifurcate. Here I'm superconducting, here I'm normal, and in there, this is where I will find Ginzburg-Landau. Okay, once again, it's kind of a slope as it goes down there, but everything is somehow has these, yeah, it's too high order in H. So that's the idea. I think, I mean, I, now how should we do this? I can explain some things about the quantum mechanics, but perhaps I do this just for people who are interested and I let everybody else go to, go to lunch and afterwards we, we talk how this really come, comes about. Is that fine? It's, I mean, I can say a few words now. Let's do it like this. I say a few words, five minutes. Okay, right, or pips even less. And then I, I explain more if, if people want to hear more. Okay, so there are several layers, I guess, to, to quantum mechanics or to these effective models. The first layer is Schrodinger theory. Okay, this is a linear theory where your um, the states over which you have to optimize a wave function of the number of variables that you have. Okay, so these are huge objects, but they are linear. The second level is that of uh, density matrices. Okay, that's what we have here. The objects over which you optimize, they are operators. But the good thing is that these operators are just operators on R3 or something. Okay, so you got rid of lots of variables, but the, what you lost is some of this commutativity. I mean, you, you have, well, or, I mean, it's operators now that you have to deal with. And then there are the simple things, like innsbruck landau theory, where you just have functions on R3. Okay, and so there are step, these three blocks, and we would like to go from the lowest to the highest from the com most complicated to the simplest. What I'm doing here, I'm going from the second thing to the third thing. What I don't understand, and as far as I understand, nobody really understands, it's how to go from the first thing to the second thing. Okay, now that being said, I should say nobody understands how to do this rigorously. The way, I mean, what BCS did is they did an upper bound, okay? So they derived this BCS functional really by, by, well, let me explain you what they did. So instead of multi, uh, minimizing over all wave functions psi of, I don't know, n variables, where n is a huge number, you mini restrict yourself to a certain small class and you just minimize over those. So that obviously gives you a higher energy. And what you would like is that in some asymptotic regime, actually they, they are the same, right? But that's what nobody can prove. So they came up, BCS came up with a certain class of states over which when I optimize over those, then I get this functional. So these are states that are characterized by this gamma and this alpha, okay? These are um, so-called uh, quasi-free states. Now the idea is, um, to explain the idea, one has to go to Fox space which sounds complicated, but it's really, really not so complicated. Fox space just means that you take block matrices, okay? So you have the one body theory in one block, and you have the two body theory in a second block, the three body theory in a third block, and so on. You have this big, you put the matrices together, and now you would say, well, what's the, the lowest point in the spectrum of block matrix? Well, it's the lowest point in every entry of this, every block, right? So, however, Thinking of this as a block matrix allows you to, to take more functions, right? Even, I mean, you would, when you compute the lowest eigenvalue of a block matrix, you would just take a, a trial function which lives in one block. However, sometimes comp purely computationally, it's simpler to take something which is, lives in all the blocks. A thing that you might have heard of are these coherent states. So coherent states, that's kind of a, a random distribution of all these blocks, um, but they are somehow strongly localized at one certain block. So that's what people, for instance, did in the derivation of these um, gross pitayevsky or nonlinear Schrodinger equation. They studied the evolution on, on um, coherent states, but then they showed that really somehow if you start, so you have first a real state which lives in a fixed block, then you extend it somehow to, to all, the, all the blocks, but then it stays kind of at the block where you really want it to stay, okay? 
but somehow because you look at the evolution in this much bigger picture, it's, it, it's nice, so you have better computational tools. Now the idea what in coherent states, it's still true, so you, you want to do something in one block, but you occupy all the other blocks. But still you only do it in a diagonal way. The idea of Barton, Cooper and Schrieffer was to not preserve the particle number. Okay, so the trial states somehow mix the, the different block. I mean, well, not mix, but really go, go away from the diagonal. Okay, which sounds, I mean, think, I mean, right, think just of a block matrix, a two by two block matrix, try to minimize this. So you would take a state that also occupies the other things, the other entries. Okay, it's, there is no way, I mean, it, it sounds not clear to me why it works, but somehow you made such a big, step when at the very beginning you said you optimize only over a certain class of states that perhaps you lost so much there but therefore you still have wiggle room somehow to make another mistake in the other direction such that um, such that, that you at the end the result is correct. So I th at the moment I think this is really just a computational tool it's one that works I mean they got the Nobel Prize and everything for this I mean that's there's no doubt that it works it's just we don't know any rigorous regime where it can be can be derived and where the true answer comes from this so the upshot they take quasi free states quasi free states depend on two matrices alpha and a gamma gamma is the ordinary thing the the particle number preserving thing that people in Hartree Fock did for ages, I mean, since the, the 20s, 1920s. The new idea is somehow to have this non-particle number uh, preserving part, that's what's encoded in the alpha. And you can um, occupy this or you cannot occupy this, okay? And, well, if it's occupied, then they call it Cooper, wave, Cooper pair wave function. It's a pairing mechanism and, well, and it works. I guess that's what I want to say. I explain it to in more details if somebody asks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's good. <laughs> Not so, so, so you, uh, next time you are going to uh, to make us understand uh, this uh, small uh, piece here. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, the idea, per coming back to what I just said, um, having these levels, mathematic, these theories on different levels, this always boils down to semi-classical analysis, essentially, where the, where there is an effective Planck constant, and one has to do something there, and one can understand. Mm, this uh, Hawkins Burglander theorizes very easily in terms of a while calculus. Okay? Now the problem that we will have and that I will address next time is that in order for the while calculus you need a lot of smoothness. So if you compose two operators, while calculus tells you how the, the composition, what the symbol of the decomposition is. But that's very hard. I mean you need more derivatives than you actually have to compute this. And we do a variational theory for us. The psi is only in H1. So we have to do a while calculus really at the level of regularity that we have. We don't have more. We cannot spend more than we have. And so therefore we have to do a lot ourselves and, and reprove these things and do some kind of uh, pseudo-differential calculus, use the specific structure. That's the preview. Thank okay, you. thanks. Uh, so please, no questions. Let's thanks. Okay, thanks.